we're going to talk about mostly the Cascadia subduction zone. Does everybody know what the Cascadia subduction zone is? Or if you don't, you will be running and screaming from the room by the time I'm done. <laughs> we are the first generation in modern history that actually understands the dangers and the effects of an earthquake on the Cascadia subduction zone. We're not the first people to know about this. Native Americans, who have been in Oregon for 10,000 plus years, Native American tribes that live at the coast for those 10,000 years, have known about Cascadia subduction zone earthquakes for 10,000 years, and have created a culture of awareness over that time with oral histories, myths, legends, historical narratives, and it's one of the things I'm going to talk about today is, is getting to that culture of awareness. We've only known that we have the potential for one of the largest earthquakes in the history of the world for about the last 20 years. And that's pretty amazing, and I'll talk about that as well. How we prepare for this event, because it's inevitable, is really going to define who we are. It's going to define our city, our state, our region, our country for decades. It will be what people remember about the Pacific Northwest when it happens. And that sounds pretty uh, radical, maybe, but think about Katrina. That is how people are going to remember New Orleans for the next hundred years and maybe longer. And the people who went through And we're going to be doing some arts and crafts uh, at the end of it with the weaving of the long ropes. So today you get, a, uh, you get a history lesson, you get an anthropology lesson, you get a geology lesson, and then we get the arts and crafts. Interesting thing to start a uh, geology talk about, but this is Oregon Historical Quarterly from summer of 2007. And I picked this up about a year ago and started looking through it because somebody had said, well, there's a couple of articles in here about... Uh, Cascadia earthquakes. Um, and sure enough, a whole section on how Native Americans related to these great subduction zone earthquakes. These earthquakes that can be magnitude nine plus in size and can last for minutes and minutes and minutes. And it got me thinking about the culture of preparedness and culture of awareness. And I began to look into it. The Native American tribes who lived uh, in the Pacific Northwest, and especially the Native American tribes that lived at the coast, were some of the most sophisticated hunter-gatherer societies in history. Um, they had a very open society. Um, they knew through myths and legends how to pass on information and historical narratives. They built their villages, most of the Native American tribes at the coast built their villages at the mouths of estuaries, right as close as they could get to the ocean. And over the course of 10,000 years, lived through at least 20 great subduction zone earthquakes. The myths, legends, and historical narratives that they created were pretty much ignored by scientists until about 20 years ago when we began to figure out that we had the potential for one of these great earthquakes and that, lo and behold, there were people that actually knew about it, uh, had created a culture that understood it and how to respond to it. And here were Native Americans that knew how to do that. When anthropologists went and looked at some of the villages, they found that the longhouses that were built uh, in Oregon at the coast were a little bit smaller than some of the longhouses built inland and built in other parts of the Pacific Northwest. And they surmised that that's because smaller wooden longhouses survive earthquakes better than larger structures. 
So even in their building materials, using wood instead of stone, and building smaller homes instead of smaller longhouses instead of large buildings, they were thinking about their response to great Cascadia subductions on earthquakes. Their stories are really fascinating. If I can find a piece in here. This is from 1906. Uh, it's a Coos text that was translated uh, back then. You know, the, the earliest stories that survived of uh, tsunamis and earthquake stories from Native Americans at the Oregon coast started in about 1860 uh, and, and were recorded in 1860. And the interesting thing is, you know, if the, if the, if the last event, one of these great subductions on earthquakes, if it occurred 150 years before that, here was oral histories, historical narratives that have been passed down for 150 years, and we know now that these historical narratives have been passed down for thousands of years. So here's one of the stories that was recorded called The Flood. And these are some excerpts from the story. When the flood tides came, there was no ebb tide. All was full of water. The earth sank into the water. Some people were ready with braided ropes they'd stored away, so they quickly went into their canoes. A small bit of land was stinking at, sticking, sticking out. Here the people assembled. Some people drifted far away. They no longer knew one another. Fear was in their hearts. hearts. Thus in this manner half the people drifted away, and they no longer knew one another. There are stories from the Quileute and Ho tribes in, uh, up in uh, Washington um, and similar myth stories that stretch all the way down to the Tillamook tribes that talk about a great battle between Thunderbird and the whale. And those happen to be references to the great earthquakes and uh, uh, tsunamis. And the stories are a even able to take into account the aftershocks that happen because in this one of the stories, Whale has a son and the Thunderbird has to battle the sun after he's defeated Whale to bring the world right again. So here's your geology lesson. The Earth is broken up into tectonic plates and these plates move around. In fact, we're moving as we speak. We're moving at about an inch west a year on the North American plate. The largest plate is the Pacific plate. And it's pushing in all different sorts of directions. And here's a little tiny plate called the Juan de Fuca plate, which used to be a huge plate, but it's basically been sucked up by North America as it moves west. And the Juan de Fuca plate is still moving northeast at about an inch a year, while North America moves at about an inch west a year. 250 million years ago, all the continents were together in one giant landmass, and over the course of this 250 million years, they've drifted apart. P plate tectonics is an incredible force, the strongest force on the Earth. The Indian plate is, is a, actually a subcontinent. Um, it's part of the Australian plate, and it's moving into Asia at about three inches a year. Now, how powerful is this process? India slamming into Asia has created the Himalayas. You can find seashells, marine fossils, at the top of the Himalayas, the top of Mount Everest. Scientists think that what is the top of Mount Everest today was actually 30,000 feet underneath the seafloor at one point. So you got 50 or 60,000 feet of offset from these two continents slamming into each other. This process of plate tectonics has created the Cascades, and the coast range, you can find marine fossils in the highest points in the coast range as well. Here's what the subduction zone looks like. It's a fault line that runs from Northern California to British Columbia, sits about 75 miles offshore. It's about 600 to 650 miles long. And the thing that makes it so amazing is when we get an earthquake on the subduction zone, we don't get it in a single epicenter. We don't get it in one point. 
the rupture actually happens along the whole 600 mile long fault. In Sumatra in 2004, a fault line very similar to our subduction zone, it unzipped. It started in the south and it moved north at about a mile a second. You can do the math, 600 miles long, mile a second, you're looking at minutes and minutes and minutes of earthquake. That's why it can be such a large earthquake. That's why this can be a magnitude nine earthquake. That's why it can be one of the largest earthquakes in the history of the world when it happens, is because it has to have one of these long faults to release that much energy. We've got other earthquakes that can happen in Oregon. In fact, we get all of the earthquakes that can happen anywhere in the world in Oregon. Score. <laughs> what, what's another type of earthquake we get? Crustle. Who said that? <laughs> what else? No? no? Will that be a, a strike slip? No, 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 no. Offshore, maybe, but in Oregon. Intraplate. Who said that? Oh. That was a much better throw, wasn't it? All right, there's a fourth type of earthquake that we get in Oregon. Nope, nope. Oh, who said that? You're right, volcanic. I will, I will throw something light, okay? Light sticks, how's that? That's right. Mount St. Helens is a perfect example. 1980, it had been rumbling and rumbling and rumbling. Got a magnitude 5 earthquake, which caused the largest landslide in history as the north face of the mountain basically slid away, which released enough overburden for the mountain to blow its top. Here's another way to look at what's happening. So you've got two plates pushing against each other. The Juan de Fuca plate is actually diving under North America. North America is actually heavier than the Juan de Fuca plate, and that's what happens in subduction zones around the world. One plate dives under another. It's not a smooth process, though. They get hung up. They lock together. And that's when we get these earthquakes, because the pressure builds over hundreds of years, and then at some point, the pressure has to let go. And that's the earthquake. We get crustal earthquakes within about the top 10 miles of the Earth's crust. We get intraplate earthquakes, which are the earthquakes that happen actually in the subducting slab. The 2001 Nisqually earthquake was an intraplate earthquake, deep, 35 miles deep within the Earth's crust. Anybody feel that one? Remember that? Yeah, that was pretty good. So I work in, over in the Portland office building, uh, Portland State office building over in the Lloyd Center, the ninth floor, and I remember that day very well. The building starts to rumble. A cheer goes up in our office. <laughs> it gives us something to do other than, you know, just stare at computer screens all day. So, you know, we're, and, and, you know, so it's been going on for about 15 minutes. So what did I do? I did not duck, cover, and hold. I went over to the big picture window. I'm not, you know, I only do this for a living. I, you know, don't practice it. Because, and you know, now we're 30 seconds into the thing, and the building's moving pretty good, and it's still kind of building. Um, but I wanted to see if the people on the ground were feeling the same thing that I was, because I know that buildings tend to react a different way than you know, ground shaking, because the building is designed to move back and forth. And sure enough, folks on the ground weren't even noticing it. I was looking outside, and they're walking around. Now, the earthquake's been going on for about a minute now. And I'm really hoping this isn't the big one, because I think I left my emergency kit at home that day. And um, we all have our emergency kits, right, at our desks and at our homes and our cars. Yes, 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 yes door. All right, so now the building is swaying back and forth and starting to creak. And I'm thinking to myself, this can't be good. State office building. Lois Bitter built the building. Just can't be good. But after about a minute and a half, the creaking stopped and it started to subside. But, you know, that was an earthquake that was 150 miles away, 35 miles deep, didn't do a lot of damage, magnitude 6.8 earthquake. So it did $2 billion worth of damage in the state of Washington. Didn't really do any damage in Oregon. 
$2 billion worth of damage sounds like a lot of damage from an earthquake. Um, and, you know, damaged the state capitol in Olympia, um, did a lot of damage in the old Pioneer uh, section of downtown Seattle, Alaskan Viaduct, lots of chimneys. But it, compare it to a crustal earthquake, an earthquake that happens within about the top 10 miles of the Earth's crust. Uh, Northridge in 1994 was a magnitude 6.7, did about 40 to $50 billion worth of damage in a community, in a city that is the best prepared place in the world for earthquakes. So that gives you an idea of the difference that 35 miles worth of you know, uh, crust can make in ground shaking. Those were long rolling earthquake waves. That's very similar to what's going to happen with a subduction zone earthquake. When we get one of these giant magnitude 9 plus earthquakes that's going to shake for minutes and minutes and minutes, it's not going to be hard violent shaking like a crustal earthquake. It's going to be long rolling earthquake waves. That's the good news. Wood frame homes do really well in these types of earthquakes. Your chimney, not so good. Brick and mortar buildings, not so good. Um, tall skyscrapers, not so good. Bridges, not so good. Um, but it's long rolling earthquake waves. If you're outside, big open field, when this earthquake happens, you will literally see waves, six foot high waves coming at you like that. In Alaska, they reported inside buildings, walls, going like this as the waves came toward them. So it's, you know, it's just, it's an amazing event. Hopefully we don't have to live through it. You know, I plan on being up in a helicopter and watching the whole thing. <laughs> you know, we live in earthquake country, but... What do you notice about this slide? <laughs> kind of spooky. We're in a quiet zone. California gets tons and tons more earthquakes than we do. The state of Washington gets six times more earthquakes than Oregon does. And here we are in this little quiet zone. This is the southern part of the Juan de Fuca Plate. That's the northern part of the Juan de Fuca Plate. Um, you hear about offshore earthquakes all the time. That's where they're happening. They're happening down here in this triple junction and along the Blanco Fracture Zone. And they are strike-slip earthquakes. The earth is moving side to side. They can't generate tsunamis, even if they get big enough. Magnitude 7s have happened in these areas, but they still won't generate tsunamis. And they don't relieve any pressure on the Cascadia subduction zone. We don't get a lot of earthquakes, so you know, we don't think about it. Um, which is interesting. So I mentioned that we've only known about the fact that we had the potential for these magnitude 9 earthquakes for about the last 20 years or so. And the clue that started it all was this ghost forest up in, off Willapa Bay, up in Washington. West, uh, a geologist named Brian Atwater in the late 80s went looking for evidence that our subduction zone was the same as every other subduction zone anywhere in the world. Up until that point, it was pretty much acknowledged that we had the only subduction zone anywhere in the world that didn't get giant earthquakes. It's just a nice, smooth process where the, you know, the Juan de Fuca Plate was diving under North America, and it was just nice because we're Americans, and we deserve <laughs> to have something nice. So, of course, but, you know, Brian was a really smart guy, and so he said, you know, I don't, uh, you know, there's been some papers written and speculation, and I'm going to go out and see if I can find some evidence. And so he went out to this ghost forest, giant western red cedars, big, beautiful trees, dead, and had been dead for a long time, and a whole forest of them. So he took core samples, and he had them dated, and it looked like that the whole forest had died at the same time, sometime between about 1690 and about 1710. And he did more research, and he, you know, dug around in the dirt and dug around the, these trees and began looking out in freshwater marshes and on the edges of bays and began to find evidence of tsunami sands in the layers of mud. And this is Young's Bay at low tide, and, which is up near Astoria. And so what happens, what he knew and what he we now know is when we get one of these giant earthquakes and the Juan de Fuca plates diving under North America, the coast actually bulges up from the contact 
as the stress builds. The bulge continues, and then the earthquake happens, and the coast actually subsides. Most places it'll subside anywhere from three to six feet. It also will lurch westward. In Alaska in 1964, in their great subduction zone earthquake, there were islands that moved 50 feet. Nine, magnitude 9.2 earthquake. Yeah, so, yeah, you know, if you got, if you got waterfront property, you're just pretty much in trouble, you know, if, if it drops six feet. Um, but, so it drops six feet, tsunami roars in, covers everything, roars back out, and over the course of the next few hundred years, the land begins to bulge upward again, and the saltwater marshes turn into freshwater marshes, and giant western red cedars can grow where it used to be salt water, and then we get another one of these earthquakes. Everything drops, covered with tsunami sands. Well, that's what Brian found. As he dug down farther and farther and farther, he found this to be the case. And what he's looking at, and it's really hard to see, but right here is a break from mud, a little bit of tsunami sand, and dry peat. Now, this is underwater most of the time, and at high tide, it's under five feet of water, but it's completely dry down here. And that's because that was a freshwater peat bog that got buried and is still just dry as a bone. So Brian elicited the help of some of his colleagues in Japan. He knew now that there was a tsunami and an earthquake that had happened in this like 20 year time frame around 1700 and he said please you know grab your researchers in Japan look through historical records and see if you can find an orphan tsunami a tsunami not associated with an earthquake for hundreds of years the Japanese have known that if there's an earthquake and you're at the coast you ought to head to high ground because it may have generated a tsunami because they have a subduction zone off their coast just like we do they're a little smarter about it because they've known for longer than 20 years that they can get giant earthquakes on this subduction zone. So sure enough, Japanese researchers found evidence, historical records, that showed that in 1700 there had been an orphan tsunami, a tsunami not associated with an earthquake. What happened was we had a magnitude 9 plus subduction zone earthquake. It generated a tsunami, which 15 minutes later slammed into the Pacific Northwest coast. But also, over the course of hours and hours, traveled across the Pacific, about 10 hours later, hit the coast of Japan, was still powerful enough to destroy villages, sink ships, kill people, destroy crops, and it was about a 25-foot wall of water. That was the final evidence that pretty much all the naysayers needed to convince them that we had the potential for these great subduction zone earthquakes. This study of the historical records in Japan came out in 1995. That's only 15 years ago. So here in the Pacific Northwest, we're really playing catch up to try to understand the potential for what can happen at any time. <laughs> I love that lady's eyes there. She's just crazed. Um, so, how big is a magnitude 9 earthquake? It's really hard to imagine. So I'm going to give you a little demonstration and we're all going to, we're all audience participation here. So let's pretend this is the energy released from a magnitude 5 earthquake. Right there. An earthquake that you feel, but probably won't do any damage. So a good starting point. So I want to take you 15 people or so right here, and on three, we're all going to clap together, please. One, two, three. Each of you, that was a magnitude 5 earthquake, okay, that you just generated. That was about the size of the Scotts Mills earthquake, a magnitude 5.6. The magnitude scale goes up about 30 to 32 times for each number that you go up. And it's a logarithmic scale. So we just generated 15 magnitude 5 earthquakes. That's a magnitude 5.6. Let's take everybody in this section here. And if y'all, one, two, three. 
All right, there's a magnitude 6 earthquake, about 30 times bigger than the magnitude 5 earthquake. And each one of those was a magnitude 5 earthquake that we just generated. All right, let's do a magnitude 7 earthquake. And we're all going to clap together, but we're going to have to keep clapping. So ready, one, two, three. All right, that's good. That was a magnitude 7. 900 times bigger than a magnitude 5. Each one of those claps was a magnet, the energy released from a magnitude 5 earthquake. All right, magnitude 8. Ready? One, two. Oh, April Fools. <laughs> because if we were going to create a magnitude 8 earthquake, we would be here for hours. Because it's 27,000 times bigger than a magnitude 5 earthquake. You all ready for the magnitude 9? Yeah, I didn't think so. Okay. That would be about 810,000 times. 810 magnitude 5, 810,000 magnitude 5 earthquakes go into a magnitude 9 earthquake. Now you can share with your children. <laughs> Let's clap for Cascadia, kids. Pretty amazing. I mean, these are huge, huge earthquakes. The largest earthquake ever recorded was the Chilean earthquake in 1960, a, a subduction zone earthquake, a magnitude 9.5. It was larger than all earthquakes in the 20th century combined. Staggering. That includes the magnitude 9.2 Alaskan earthquake, the magnitude 8.5 uh, Mexico City earthquake. Every earthquake that ever happened in California and every earthquake that happened anywhere in the world for a hundred years wasn't as big as that magnitude 9.5 earthquake. The last great subduction zone earthquake to happen anywhere in the world was the Sumatran earthquake in 2004, January, uh, December 26th. It ruptured along about a 600 mile long fault. It started in the south, unzipped at a mile a second, moving north. Thousands of people lost their lives in the earthquake but we're not really sure because of the tsunami. The tsunami killed over 250,000 people. It was bigger than anybody ever imagined a tsunami could be. When you take the little jelly bean there and you flip it over and you put it right on the Pacific Northwest, it fits real nicely. That is almost a carbon copy of what we've got offshore here in the Pacific Northwest. And it got our scientists to thinking that, you know, perhaps when we mapped the coast for tsunami inundation and started creating evacuation maps for coastal communities in the late 90s, you know, we were doing the absolute best science that we could at the time. And Sumatra changed everything. These earthquakes are so huge that they can shift the North Pole, slow the Earth's rotation, and change the shape of the Earth. And that happens every single time we get one of these subductions on earthquakes. The tsunami that is generated from the subductions on earthquake is the most destructive thing about it. The shaking's pretty bad. I mean, trying to go through, you know, 10 minutes of ground shaking is going to be really, really scary. Scariest thing's ever going to happen to you in your life. On the other hand, it may not be so bad. In Alaska, people reported, you know, their houses just being pummeled back and forth and, and plates flying from the kitchen all the way across the house and smashing against the walls on the other side of the house. Other people reported that they got bored and sat down on their couch and waited for it to stop shaking. So you never know. This is the, uh, about an hour and a half later as the tsunami, the first wave, approached Thailand. So it had already hit Banda Aceh. The water has receded. This used to be about six feet deep. This is the ocean floor. Look how far it's receded out. Some people wonder what's going on. Some people are running toward it. This lady was actually going out to warn her family. I don't think she needed to do that, but it was nice of her. And that's the first wave. It was only about 30 feet high. And I use these slides because, remarkably, this family survived, where many didn't. But there were run-ups 
in certain parts of Sumatra and in Thailand and in India and other places where the, the actual wave height as it came inland, and it wasn't necessarily the first wall of water that was the largest. Um, it could be the third or fourth wall of water because tsunamis are not just one wave that sweeps in. It's actually a series of waves that sweep in for about 30 minutes and then sweep back out and sweep in and sweep out for over 10 to 12 hours. And the third or fourth wave can actually be larger than the first. There were, there were wave heights up to 70 feet high. And there were run-ups, how far, far inland the water pushed that went up to 125 feet above sea level. So imagine this is Seaside, the most vulnerable community at the coast. How many of us love to go to Seaside? I go all the time. Cannon, imagine it's Cannon Beach. Um, and so here's a, you know, here's a 40 or 50 foot wall of water. And you're staying in this really nice hotel, three or four stories high. Great view, oh, I'll be fine. Here comes the tsunami and yuck. Pretty amazing. So our scientists went back in the field. Cannon Beach was the first place that we went back to and began all new mapping. And that's Rob Witter, one of our geologists, in a Sitka bog uh, outside of Cannon Beach looking for tsunami sands. And I'll show you. Um, so here's actually the new map that we've made at Cannon Beach. Um, this red area is actually for a distant tsunami, but the red area on here is pretty much what we estimated to be the height of the largest tsunami back in the late 90s. The yellow part on this map is, worst case scenario, what we think now is going to happen in Cannon Beach. Much, much higher. So the picture that Rob was at was right here at uh, Ecola Creek down in the bogs and he found evidence, he found tsunami sands here from an event that happened about 1100 years ago and it was one of the worst case events. And to give you an idea, here's the bridge across Ecola Creek at Highway 101. Here we are standing at the bridge and what Rob told me was in a worst case event the water would be 60 feet higher than the bridge. We're a half mile inland. A normal event, a normal subduction zone earthquake that generates a normal size tsunami, the water is going to be 20 feet above the bridge. So Sumatra has changed a lot about what we know about the potential for tsunamis at the coast, and we're working very, very hard to help the communities down there, understand it, and get ready for it. Subduction zone earthquakes. Our subduction zone earthquake, three to five minutes. It will affect 10 million plus people from Northern California to British Columbia, basically from the coast inland to the Cascades. Vancouver, British Columbia, Seattle, Tacoma, Olympia, Portland, Eugene, Eureka, all the way up and down the coast. We know it's occurred 14 times over the last 4,800 years. That's some of the research that Rob has done. That only gives us a recurrence interval of about every three to 343 years on average. We know there have been 20 events in the last 10,000 years. And they've occurred, if you factor in all the events, you're looking at about 500 years, give or take a couple of hundred years. We know that the last great subduction zone earthquake happened on January 26th at 9 p.m. in the year 1700 because of the historical records from Japan and how they were able to calculate how long it would take the tsunami to travel across the Pacific. Oh, and then there's the aftershocks. And that's something that nobody really factors into the planning and the preparedness is the aftershocks. Here's a little computer model of aftershocks in Sumatra, and it takes in about five weeks of aftershocks um, over about a 30-second period. So boom, there's the first rupture. These are the aftershocks. 
They're still getting aftershocks today on this fault. They're get, still getting magnitude seven and eight earthquakes in this area. They're still getting tsunamis. There was a tsunami down here that killed about 500 people. And boom, there's, you know, five weeks later and there's still just clusters and clusters of earthquakes. Really scary. The top statement is a consensus statement from all the scientists in the world that study the Cascadia subductions on earthquake. They all got together for the tricentennial, the 300th anniversary of the last earthquake, in what town? Seaside. Kind of makes you wonder, doesn't it? You know, maybe if they had all, you know, if the thing had happened then and they all got swept out, we wouldn't have to worry about this, right? <laughs> we know that can happen. We know that there's about a one in six chance of it happening in the next 50 years or so. But wait, <laughs> there's new evidence. Chris Goldfinger, an OSU researcher who's been doing. Um, research in offshore turbidites, underwater landslides offshore, that every time there's a subduction zone earthquake, it causes a little underwater landslide. You can take those disturbed muds and, uh, you know, the, the, the stuff that slides. It has little bitty microscopic organisms, and you can date them, it turns out. And what Chris has found is the southern part of the subduction zone ruptures independently of the whole thing about twice as often. That's a magnitude 8.5, magnitude 8.8 .8 earthquake every 220 years on average. And it also seems to trigger the northern San Andreas Fault about 50 or 60 years later. Pretty amazing. That's, that, that study came out last year. So, you know, there's still lots and lots that we're beginning to understand. Um, and this kind of begins to change people's minds about, uh, you know, the potential for one of these great earthquakes in the Pacific Northwest. Then there's another cool thing that they've found. Uh, the, the, the Canadian uh, Geologic Society has found a thing called episodic tremor and slip. So, because the Juan de Fuca plate is pushing up against North America, northeast, it, it causes the whole basically coast to go northeast with it. And so those are the little arrows. So, and, and this happens only up in the northern part of the subduction zone, up in Washington and British Columbia. So it gets pushed about four centimeters, about an inch a year, to the northeast, but then every 14 months, like clockwork, it slips back the other direction. They noticed this in the mid-90s, thought it was a big truck going by outside because the signature of the, you know, the seismograph just shook a little bit, but it shook for a couple of weeks. And so they really couldn't figure out what was going on. They thought it was instrumentation. It turns out that the trimmer and slip takes about two weeks and it releases the energy of about a magnitude six and a half earthquake over that two week period. That's why they had so much trouble identifying it. Now they know what to look for. It happens like clockwork up there every 14 months. The next time it's going to happen is May of this year. It doesn't happen on our part of the subduction zone. We get these episodic tremor and slips, but it's much more irregular. And it can last a whole lot longer. It can last months, so it's really hard to detect. The, the Canadian Geologic Society, uh, uh, Geologic Organization, whatever they are, um, they have said that they think there is a heightened chance of a subduction zone earthquake when this episodic tremor and slip episode happens. U.S. Geological Survey uh, scientists don't agree with them at this point, but this is something that's still being studied. This study didn't come out till the, you know, about three or four years ago. So there's still lots and lots of stuff that we're still studying about this and still learning about this. 
And of course, we know that the, the state's going to be kicking in tons and tons of money on you know, or tsunami and earthquake research over the next couple of years. Right? Unfortunately, no. We, get, we actually get funding from uh, the National Tsunami Hazard Mitigation Fund through, the, through NOAA, the folks who have the National Weather Service and, the, and the, do a lot of uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, and, and we're grateful to them. All right, so I'm going to take you back to uh, a Native American story called Weaving Long Ropes. And this was a story by Jason Yonker. He's a member of the Coquille tribe, and this was told to him by his uncle many years ago. Long ago, our people learned a great lesson, to beware that a great tide might sweep many of them away. Just like the fog comes in now, a great tide might come in like that. The people were told by their elders to weave long ropes, because you will not know when a big tide is coming, and you won't have much time. If you don't have long ropes and the water rises, you'll be swept away. They were warned over and over, but few paid attention. Many ignored the warnings and went about their daily business. Sounds familiar. One day, a great shaking made a big tide. The water rushed up the valleys and covered many in the villages. Only those who had listened to their elders were prepared. The waters rose violently. Many of the people were unable to make it to their canoes. Those few who had prepared for the great tide quickly gathered their ropes. The waters rose higher and higher until only the tops of the tallest trees could be seen. Those who had ropes quickly tied their canoes to the treetops. Soon all the trees were covered and only those few who had woven long ropes remained, for these were the wise people who had heeded the elders' warnings. So here's one of those historical narratives. This is not the myth of thunderbirds and whales. This is a literally a historical narrative that had been handed down. This is recorded 20 or 30 years ago. So we're talking about 300 years that this story has been handed down to present day Native American tribes and, and people in the tribes. And this was interesting. This was also in the historical quarterly about, uh, you know, our response and Native Americans' response to a great subduction zone earthquake. How they themselves, they are not disasters or catastrophes, but we make them that way with our actions. So it really behooves us to begin creating this culture of awareness. You guys need to take this information and share it because it's going to affect you and your family and your community and neighborhood and city and state. You can help spread the word. You can help begin making this culture of awareness, creating this culture of preparedness, because it's going to take everybody. And when you go to the coast, you know those cute little tsunami evacuation signs you see there? Pay attention to them. Know where high ground is. Take an emergency kit with you. It's really important. And I will finally leave you with probably the most important advice that I can give you on a day like today. Always rely on the innate intuition of animals. Thank you very much.